Hello, BookTube, and welcome back to a series of videos in which I'm reading you a book. We are reading The Gospel According to St. Matthew in the King James Translation, and we are up to chapter 21 in the story of our main character, Jesus of Nazareth, and his band of loyal disciples. And the human drama that is about to engulf the story is right ready to take off. Jesus has now been repeatedly telling his disciples that he is marching to his death. But he is not going to live a long life of giving lessons and telling parables and teaching them how to do things. That he is destined to die horribly, tortured, and then crucified. Uh, they haven't liked this news. He has never said that news without following it up by saying that three days after he dies, he will rise again from the dead. But the, God, the disciples don't seem to listen to that. They're, they're caught up on the horror of this the shock of all their hopes that this this messiah of theirs this this religious figure of theirs is going to be apprehended and killed and that's going to happen obviously when jesus is brought into connection with power that's not going to happen by a mob the mobs are on his side uh so in this coming chapter he actually enters jerusalem so we enter into the final stage here uh this is chapter 21 and we'll see what we make of it and when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, and were come to Bethphage, unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find an ass tied, and a colt with her. Loose them, and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught to you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. All this was done, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Sion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the foal of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and colt, and put them on their clothes, and they set him thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. I want to point out, as I've said many times before, that is not a prophecy. The prophecy would be on that day, coming into Jerusalem, on an ass with a coal, with a colt beside it, will be a man named Jesus from Galilee. That would be a prophecy. Saying that something is going to happen is not a prophecy. You have, but, uh, but anyway, you can see the grandeur here. You can see the stage setting. This is not an entrance into Jerusalem that the chief priests and scribes of the temple can possibly ignore. And they don't ignore it. Uh, and Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the, tem the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. And said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but ye have made it into a den of thieves. Uh, and the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple, and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased. And said unto him, Hearest thou what they say? And Jesus said unto them, Yea, have ye never heard, have ye never read out of the mouths of babes and sucklings? Thou hast perfected praise. And he left them and went out of the city into Bethany, and he lodged there. Uh, so it, the, the crowd is hailing Jesus as basically the Messiah. They're not using that word, but they are using exalted language that, they're, that, that immediately strikes the ears of the chief priests and scribes. They go to Jesus and say, do you hear what these people are saying about you? They're giving him a chance to deny it. To say, I don't have any control over what my followers do. Uh, to give, you know, a, a social media excuse, basically. And he doesn't do it. In, instead, he he doesn't explicitly echo it himself. But he, he says, uh, this is basically divine praise. This is, this is totally uh, justifiable. And he's all, already created a huge uproar in the temple precinct itself. That bit about people selling doves, the, the money changers and the people selling doves, they are selling offerings and live animals for blood sacrifice inside the temple to people who came to Jerusalem for worship but didn't bring their own worship livestock. They didn't bring their own sacrificial animals. That was a huge uh, 
trade, a huge source of income for the temple. Jesus has disrupted that. So on every level, he is making enemies of, of these people. Uh, now in the morning, as he returned into the city, he hungered. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only, and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforward forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do that which is done to this fig tree, but also if ye, have, if, if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. All things, whatsoever ye ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. I want to point out again, as I pointed out when we hit this passage in Mark, that that is false. And you cannot, I know, I know this has been glossed and, and, and uh, analogized a million times, you cannot do that. Jesus has just withered a fig tree that other people can see, and that was healthy before he did it. That was not metaphorical. And he himself is saying, just as I did with that, you also can do with physical things. It is not, it is not open to metaphorical glossing. He is saying, if believers believe, they can move mountains literal mountains, and that is not true. Thousands and thousands of Christians have, have begged and pleaded for everything over the millennia, in unison. Jesus isn't even saying that you need a communal effect. He's saying if one Christian truly believes, they can move mountains. But even whole communities, begging and pleading in absolutely perfect faith, do not have this effect. This simply is not true. Uh, it's Jesus who can do it. Uh, but anyway, uh, let's, let's move on here. Because uh, we have a ways to go. This is not a short chapter like the last couple. And when he was come un into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority dost thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? And Jesus answered and said unto them, I also will ask you one thing. And if you will tell me, I and likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, that's John the Baptist, we've, we've met in this chapter, in this, in this uh, gospel. Whence was it? From heaven or from men? And they, that is the chief priests and scribes, reasoned within themselves, saying, if, he shall, if we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, why then did ye not believe him? But if we, say, if we shall say of men, we fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. And they answered Jesus and said, we cannot tell. And he said unto them, neither, neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. Which is kind of petty. It's it's petty on their part. They're trying to trap him into blasphemy, but it's petty on his part too. Uh, it's whether or not they acknowledge John is certainly not part of his mission. Uh, but <laughs> uh, the, Jesus continues to speak to them. But what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, "Son, go work today in my vineyard." Again with the vineyards. Uh, he answered and said, "I will not." But afterwards he repented and went. And he came to, he, that is the man, the vineyard owner, came to the second and said likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir, but went not. Whether of them twain did the will of his father? And the, the, the chief priests answered, they say unto him, the first. Jesus say unto the, saith unto them, verily I say unto you, that the publicans and harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. It, to, to put it colloquially, Dems is fighting voids. <laughs> uh, for John came unto you in the way of the righteous, and ye believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him, and ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterwards, that ye might believe him. Again, this weird stress on the ministry of John the Baptist. It seems odd to put this much, maybe it doesn't seem odd to you, it seems odd to me for Jesus to put so much pressure on this. This is now the second time that he has abraded these chief priests and scribes of the temple for how they treated John the Baptist, uh, who's been dead, we presume, for quite some time now. Uh, here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard, again with the vineyard, <laughs> which planted a vineyard and edged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen, that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandman took his servants, and beat one, and killed another, and stoned another. 
Again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent of them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said amongst themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him, and cast him out of the, wine, the vineyard, and slew him. When the Lord, therefore, of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? And the, the chief priests are listening, of course, they, and they, they're not hearing anything they like, but they listen, and then they answer. They say unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men, and will let out his vineyard unto husband, other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits of their seasons. Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, that same has become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say unto you, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. And when the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude, because they took him for a prophet. So there you have the, the echo. The, uh, uh, because the, the, great, the, the great multitudes took John for a prophet. And the, multi, the, the echo of the language here is the writer of the gospel saying that the chief priests and scribes, having been openly insulted to their faces, this itinerant preacher from the countryside not only attacked the money, the money changers and the, and the sacrifice sellers in the temple, which is their source of livelihood, but also told them, the kingdom of heaven shall be taken from you and given to other people. So on two headings, if, if Joe Schmo walked in out of the countryside and said those two things at the portico of the great temple, he would have been immediately arrested and no one would ever have seen him again. They can't lay hands on Jesus. to do. He has given them every bit as much provocation, but they can't lay hands on him because, as we've been told in this chapter, he's surrounded by crowds of people and they're worried about a riot. Uh, but I, it's, that's very fascinating. And it also, the, uh, the gospel, or the author of this gospel here is, has now drawn the lines completely. Again, I will say, I don't see why those lines exist at all. But if you want to provide a starkly human story, well, the, the stage is now set. This is now irrevocable. Neither side is going to budge. And the chief priests and scribes have not only been insulted, they've been insulted in their own temple, in the hearing of their own people. So the machinery is in place. When he was out in the countryside and preaching, and we were told that they thought, now they will take, they will take advice on how to destroy him, it was vague enough. Now it's not vague. Now it's two sides, one on one side, one on the other, both mortally opposed to each other. The only other point I'll make here is a point that I made, I've made a few times with parables that Jesus says, in which one of the figures in the parable is clearly meant to be God. In the last chapter, it was the vineyard owner, the Lord of the vineyard. In this case, it is also the vineyard owner. And I want to point out that in both those cases and in the parable of the sower, the figure that is supposed to be God in the parable is wrong, is in error. <laughs> the, the owner of the vineyard, the lord of the vineyard here in this story, sends servants and learns that the servants that he sent were killed. He then sends more servants, and those servants are also killed by the people he is managing his property. And then he sends his son and says, well, surely they'll respect my son. And the son is killed. I want to point out, again, I know that these things are open to all kinds of glossing, and I've read some entertaining glossing on, on this very parable, but I want to point out that in the real world that these parables are supposed to represent in order to help people in the real world to understand Jesus' message, in the real world, the fault is entirely on the Lord of this vineyard. After the first servants are killed, he shouldn't have sent any more servants, let alone his son. He is wrong to do that. That is... <laughs> it is, to put it mildly, counterintuitive. It's a parable where if you, if you extract it from the gospel and from the mouth of the Messiah and had someone else say it and, and didn't gloss it at all, just said, okay, there's no freight, no narrative freight here at all. Just, I'm going to tell you this parable about this Lord of this vineyard. He sets up an elaborate, uh, presumably prosperous vineyard gives it over to managers, and leaves for a foreign country. Then when the time comes and he knows that the, the, the vineyard has been harvested and that there is fruit, he wants his cut. He sends 
uh, managers. He sends emissaries to go and collect his cut. He is not asking for more than his share. We presume he is not at, he is not turning out the middle managers who run the, the vineyard in his absence. They just want his cut, and those emissaries are killed. Then he sends more emissaries, and they're killed as well, and then he sends his own son. What do you think of that parable? If you took this out of a gospel, removed all the narrative freight about the world not knowing what it's seeing, anyone hearing that story would say, well, what's wrong with the Lord of the Vineyard? What, what's his problem? He should have learned at the beginning. He should have learned after the first time that his, his managers have turned against him and gone homicidal. He certainly shouldn't have sent his son. <sighs> So, so you get a, a parable like this, or the last one, or the parable of the sower, and you just have to, you just have to immediately start glossing it. You just have to immediately start putting a faith faith layers on top of it, or it just doesn't work as a story. It just doesn't work. It it blames the person that it should be exonerating. Uh, but anyway, Jesus is telling these parables, but he has refused in every the the main action of this chapter is that he is refusing in any way to accommodate scribes and the chief priests of the temple, who now have the power over him. They might not want to seize him when there are crowds around him, but there aren't always crowds around him. You, If you're reading this chapter, if you're reading the gospel up to this point, you might suspect that Jesus is not going to leave Jerusalem alive. So that tension is building. Uh, and we'll, we'll wrap this up for now. We'll move on to the next chapter next time. <laughs> Thank you, Booktube.